Hey guys, yeah, thanks for the welcome and uh, thanks for the, the talk earlier about charity, really interesting stuff and pertinent to us because we'll be doing a pretty big Elasticsearch cluster upgrade soon. So hopefully we, we fall into the, uh, the good upgrade or better upgrade camp for that. Yeah, so um, I'm going to be talking today about large scale data processing and introducing um, Apache Spark. Just a little bit about me. As Mike mentioned, um, I'm ML Nick on Twitter. I'm a co-founder of Graphflow, which is a uh, startup that offers a software service recommendation engine and customer intelligence platform. We're built from the ground up uh, on, on Apache Spark. Um, I've been around in the project for uh, about two and a half years now, and I was one of the early, uh, early people involved. Um, so I'm a, I'm a uh, PMC member and an Apache Spark committer, very proud of that. Uh, and I've just published a book about machine learning with Spark by Pact, so if you're interested, please uh, go and have a look. So agenda for today is to talk about this, this term which uh, Willem hates, as we heard on the first day, big data. Um, kind of what is it, uh, where does it come from, uh, why is it so scary, uh, what should we do about it, cutting through a bit of the hype. Uh, then it's, it's, it's kind of beneficial before talking about Spark to, to talk about another project called Hadoop. Um, and we'll talk about herding elephants and, and the background about big data and, and the, the latest and how they came about. And then introduce Apache Spark and the project. And I'll try, uh, I, I normally try and do a little bit of a demo. So if we, if we, if we have the time, I'll, uh, I'll try and then. So big data. Uh, it's everywhere. You know, what is big data? You know, um, it's, uh, it's everywhere. We're seeing big data brains. Uh, we've got the wave of big data. You know, you need to catch it or you're going to get left behind. We're floating in a sea of binary. It's everywhere. Uh, you look, uh, we're lost in it. Big data lakes. It's the dawn of big data. So, there is a lot of hype out there, um, and big data is a kind of overused term, and, and I personally also don't like it uh, very much. Um, but what it, you know, it, is it just hype, or is there something to it? And uh, there is something to it. Uh, there is a lot of hype, but if we cut through it, there is a massive and growing amount of data that, that is being collected. Um, it's not that this, this didn't exist. You know, um, it's things like uh, you know, web traffic, um, scientific measurements from CERN and SCAR. Um, it's, it's the Internet of Things or connected devices. Um, it's not that, that this, you know, it's not suddenly that the data uh, is appearing out of nowhere. It was always there. Um, it's, it's, it's just that now we, we have the ability to both collect it and store it. Before, we might be able to collect it, but we didn't have the capacity to store it uh, at any reasonable cost. Now, through Moore's Law and the cost of compute, disk RAM is all dropped significantly and it's reached a point where it's cheap enough to not worry about what we store. You know, do, do we have to throw this piece of data away? Do we have to throw this record away? Let's keep the most important stuff. We've moved into, into a new kind of era of store everything because we can and it doesn't cost too much and we'll figure out what to do with it later. Um, so the other part of the hype about so-called big data is uh, is linked to the uh, to the processing side. So we could store it. Uh, we can now store it, um, and it's it's cheap enough to do that. But uh, before we couldn't, you know, even if we could store it, we couldn't really process it. Um, or if we could, then the cost was massively prohibitive. So the other the other kind of side of the coin is we now have uh, tools, and and I'll talk about them. Obviously, open source tools. Um, that allow us to process and, and transform and analyze all of this data. Uh, and the reason we need these tools is, you know, Moore's law and, and, and hardware and performance is, is increasing rapidly, but, it's, but this, the, the volume of data that we're storing and, and processing uh, is still way higher than, than single node performance can handle. So I, I came across this uh, quote the other day from the Confluent.io Confluent blog, uh, a bunch of guys who Ex LinkedIn, they, they created Kafka and uh, they've started a, a startup. And I really like it. Um, you know, so much of what people refer to when they talk about big data is really the act of capturing these events that previously weren't recorded anywhere and putting them to use in an organization. Um, they talk about the, it's the other side of, of the, the story that the database table, which is a static view of your data, it's the event stream. It's the, you know, it, it's the, 
the stream of updates, deletes, um, and, and, and events that, that happen in a business. And that's really what, what I like to, uh, that's, what, that's what I mean, I guess, when I talk about big data myself. So no discussion of this topic is really complete without uh, talking about elephants and Hadoop. So Google really led the way in, in this field and they were doing you know, big data and, and parallel processing before it was, it was cool, before everyone else was. And they, uh, you know, when they sort of finish with a technology and, and they, they end of life it internally, they tend to release an academic paper and give it to the rest of the world. So we had the, the Google file system paper in 2003, which is, uh, which is released by them, uh, a way of, of storing uh, a whole bunch of data across a cluster of, of computers. Uh, and that became the Apache Hadoop distributed file system out of Yahoo. Uh, the MapReduce paper, a way of splitting up computer process uh, so that you can execute it on uh, a cluster of machines became Apache MapReduce, Hadoop MapReduce. Big Table became Apache HBase. You know, we've got Dremel becoming Drill. So they tend to, uh, to, to, to throw out their sort of used technologies and it becomes an Apache project. Uh, Spark's a bit different, so, so that's great. So we're seeing some, uh, some new entrance into the, uh, into the innovation uh, game in this field. So what is Hadoop? Uh, it started at Yahoo. Um, they, they, they essentially took the, the Google Papers for distributed file system and MapReduce and created their own project, their own version, which they called Hadoop. The, the name, uh, as with most, most Apache projects, comes from a, uh, you know, you have to have a funny name for your project. Um, Hadoop comes from the toy elephant, that, uh, Doug Cutting's son, uh, his to toy elephant, and that was the name um, of, of that toy. So that's where it comes from. They then built this internally and, it run, and, and, and they now you know, have a massive deployment running more than 40,000, 50,000 nodes. And then they took the decision to open source everything, um, which is great. Yeah, and that spawned an entire big data industry. Cloudera was, the, was one of the first uh, companies, uh, kind of the red hat of, of data uh, and large scale data processing and, and you know, backed by Hadoop, um, MapR, Hortonworks, and a, you know, a bunch of others. And now uh, you know, a, new, uh, a new era with projects like Spark and, and Kafka, you see in Confluent, um, Databricks, and so on. Ah, sure, okay. So, oh, that's much better. <laughs> so, Hadoop and parallel processing technologies are all about new scaling. So the old scaling was horizontal, uh, so, sorry, vertical. Uh, big tin. You know, when you ran out of capacity, you just added more uh, resources to your hardware. You you added more CPU, you added more uh, memory, you added more disks, but onto one node. Um, that gets expensive, both from a hardware and software perspective. You know, because yes, you can you can get uh, you can get proprietary software that can run on on these big um, these big appliances, but it costs a fortune, and it gets you know the, the thing gets delivered to your data center in a in a on a forklift or in a huge truck. And it costs millions and millions of dollars. Hadoop and and the new technologies are all about the new scaling, which is horizontal, shared nothing, embrace failure, commodity hardware. And and because it can run, run on commodity hardware, and you push a lot of the the fault tolerance and and the parallel processing to the software layer, uh, you know it's it's a lot cheaper. Uh, and it's all about embracing failure at scale and designing for that. So Hadoop is made up of two systems, as I mentioned, HDFS, which is the file system, and MapReduce, which is the, the computation system. They both got, have similar architectures. Um, so HDFS is made up of two processes, effectively. First is a name node, um, and that takes care of uh, file, you know, the file system housekeeping. Um, it knows where all the, all the files are, uh, all the blocks and the different nodes. You then have a bunch of data nodes, and they're normally uh, one per physical machine or, or, or virtual machine in your cluster, and they're responsible for storing, uh, storing files. So the way HDFS works is, is your, your logical file is kind of split up into a bunch of blocks, and each data node carries uh, some of those blocks. Uh, this, the software system takes care of fault tolerance and replication. So you can see, you know, we've got uh, we've got a bunch of different blocks. We've got a replication factor of one. So each of those blocks exists somewhere else on on the system. So fairly fairly kind of standard um, as you would you would have in 
no SQL databases like Cassandra and, and, and Mongo and so on, but this is, this is more kind of a static file system. So fault tolerance uh, means that if you lose a node, then uh, the name node now knows about this, uh, that a data node is missing and handles the, the, the uh, re-replication of that data. MapReduce works in much the same way, um, and it, it also has two types of, of processes, the first being a job tracker, which is responsible for housekeeping, um, and the task trackers, which are responsible for actually executing tasks. So the, the architecture is very similar uh, between the two, and, and they're, they're often they're, you know, part of, they're, they're, they're distinct uh, projects in, 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 you know, in effect, but, they, um, but they, they tend to be sort of installed and co-located. So often you would have a master node in your cluster that, that runs a name node as well as a job tracker, and you have uh, slave nodes, that each of which run a data node and a task tracker. So where, whereas HDFS is responsible for storing uh, and reading and writing data off of disk in a distributed way, MapReduce is responsible for computing on that data in a distributed way. So again, the old, para the old sort of paradigm, the old scaling is, is bring the data to your computation, pull in data from a database um, into, you know, into a node, uh, run that computation, run some processing, and kind of feed it back. MapReduce is all about taking your computation to the data and scaling that way. Um, so it's, it's locality aware, and you ship your code, the computation that you want to run, to the location of the data rather than the other way around. Um, much more scalable. It's a short, sort of shared nothing architecture, so every job, every piece of computation, um, which we'll talk about shortly, the, the kind of map phase of this whole map reduce uh, operates on a different uh, block of data. So again, fault tolerance works in much the same way. Task trackers uh, are located on a data node and they work on the data on that node. If you lose one, task tracker just gets uh, reallocated to, to where that replica exists. Um, so what ha you know, your, your job will still uh, be successful. You won't lose any data. It might take a bit longer because the, the, that particular task has to restart, but you don't lose anything. So what does MapReduce actually look like? Um, just a quick kind of show of hands. Uh, who here has actually heard of Hadoop and kind of knows what it is? Okay, so quite a few. Um, who of you have actually used it? And any functional programmers in the audience? Okay, so quite a few of, of you know have heard of Hadoop. You've got, probably got a decent idea of what it is. Fewer have actually used it, um, but you know the MapReduce sort of approach and the uh, and functional programming are very, very close to each other. So you have all of this data that is sitting around in, in blocks distributed across your cluster. You don't have to care where, where it actually exists. You know, so, th so the abstraction is, is that you, you just have a, uh, a directory, but the reality is that directory is split across five nodes, 10 nodes, 10,000 nodes. Uh, when you execute a, a map reduced job, the first phase is the map phase. And you know, as you can see here, you. You, you want to take uh, lines in a text file. Um, each task operates on a different block, so now you've, you've got that splitting. You uh, break up the, the, the number of uh, the, the text file into a bunch of words, and you emit word and the, the, the number one from your map phase. You then have a shuffle across the cluster, um, and you go to a reduce phase. Now, the reducer is guaranteed to receive all the values for a given key, as you can see here. You know, for, for the word bear, for the word car, for the word deer. This happens by you know, hashing uh, across the cluster. Pretty straightforward stuff. And your reducer is responsible for adding up all of those ones and you, at the end, combining everything and you get a final result, which is, you know, th this is the, the famous word count in MapReduce, which is the, the, normal, uh, the normal example. So Hadoop is a distributed system for counting words effectively. So what does it look like? Uh, diving into kind of a little bit of Java code, which, uh, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, but it's for good reason, as you'll see later. So this is what a, um, a, map, uh, a map task for the word count looks like. Um, you know, you have this mapper, you've got a lot of boilerplate, um, you create, you know, your output, which is a word there. Um, again, a lot of boilerplate, you've got to read this thing, you've got to tokenize it. Um, 
And at the end, of, at the end you write out uh, word and, and the number one. So li line by line in your, in your data, you, you, you're splitting a text, you're omitting this thing, this, this, uh, this key value pair. The reduce is, is, is again, uh, Java class, quite a bit of boilerplate. Um, all it does is takes, takes those key value pairs and for each key sums up the values and then writes them out. You've got a lot of job set up code. Uh, you have to set your, your input class, your, your output class, your map reduce class, uh, paths, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, it, it's, uh, for anyone who's, who's actually written raw Java map reduce jobs, you know, this is the simplest possible one you can get. And already we're at many, many lines of code. So Hadoop is, you know, is fantastic because it has really ushered in this new era of being able to, uh, with, for very low cost, uh, fractions of the cost of, of uh, you know, proprietary hardware and software, um, you, know, you, you, can, you can compute uh, across terabytes and terabytes and even and now petabytes of data. Um, you know, massively scalable, well over 40,000 uh, nodes running in, in production at Yahoo for years and years. Um, it's, it's extremely fault tolerant. Uh, you know, it's really good at that. Uh, HDFS, you know, you, you can lose nodes. Uh, you, you can, depending on how your, your clusters are set up, you could potentially lose racks. You can even sometimes lose data centers, depending on, you know, if you're running uh, cross data center clusters um, and your jobs are still complete, everything will still be fine. You will not lose data. So the, the, the cons are, are many, but I mean, probably the most important are that you have to hit the disk for every single job multiple times. So a job, you know, we just saw a word count job. I mean, that's, that's uh, again, the simplest thing you can do. And you can already see that it's got multiple phases. So if you've got a complex uh, analytics pipeline, a complex ETL, machine learning, for example, highly iterative in nature, where you have to re read the same data over and over and over again, Every single time you've, you've got, you're hitting the disk to read that data um, and to write it back out for the next stage. So it becomes extremely IO intensive and that slows things down. Um, it also has a lot of overhead for launching tasks and jobs, so that's, um, that also makes it kind of slow. Um, and a very unwieldy API, you know, I mean, you have to write raw Java map reduce, it's, it's not fun at all. Uh, but that has spawned a whole bunch of, uh, of kind of higher level APIs and frameworks, cascading, scolding. Uh, crunch both in Java and Scala and other languages. So why Spark? So Spark, now an Apache project, uh, was born out of the University of Berkeley Big Data Lab. Um, and it's designed from the ground up to, to be both Hadoop compatible but to, uh, to solve some of the main issues and, and shortcomings of the Hadoop system. So it, it does this by focusing on two aspects. The first is um, making it really easy and cheap and fast to launch large numbers of tasks, so low overhead per task. And the second is uh, in-memory caching. So it uses, it caches data and intermediate data sets in memory, uh, which means that the first time you read something, yes, it takes about as long as it might with a Hadoop job. It's actually faster by quite a bit. Um, but the second time, or then the third time, and the fourth time, and the hundredth time that you do that, uh, it's blazingly fast because everything's in memory across your cluster. Uh, the third and, and possibly more important in many ways um, is, is around developer performance. So instead of having this low-level Java API um, you know, and, and, and re then relying on third-party frameworks and libraries to maybe make your life a little bit easier, you have a rich functional-based uh, distributed collections API in Scala, Python, Java, and uh, you do have one in R currently. It's not, it's not part of the core project, but it will be soon. And these are all first-class citizens um, and part of the core project. They all ship with, with Apache Spark. So it makes writing your large-scale processing and analytics machine learning tasks much simpler. Again, for those of you who might know a bit of, about the Hadoop kind of ecosystem, um, there's a lot of, you know, you have a Hadoop core and you have many, many other projects around Hadoop. So built on top of the uh, other projects. So you have Hive for, for SQL. Uh, you now have Drill, which is a kind of a Dremel um, uh, sort of SQL uh, project that uses HDFS. You've got 
Um, you've got Storm, which which kind of uses HDFS, but it's it's a, it's it, it's compatible, but not part of the Hadoop ecosystem for stream processing. So you've got a lot of different projects. Um, you know, a Cloudera installation has probably 20 different projects installed on all the nodes. Spark is one core project for large-scale data processing, distributed SQL engine, machine learning, and stream processing. So one project for all of these use cases. And because of the API design and the, you know, the underlying architecture, it can support all of them with high performance. So we saw you know, our, our Hadoop MapReduce Java word count, which was ugly and, and long and painful. This is the same one, same, same program in Spark in using Scala. So I've, I've highlighted in, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the colors, probably not, but it, you know, effectively you're telling it the path with the you know, context.txt file, uh, you apply your map uh, function there in purple, uh, you, you sp after you've split the line, um, you emit your words and your, and your ones and you just call a reduce by key function with a sum, uh, you're passing in the sum function there and then you save it out. So significantly simpler. And that same code will now run on your local machine with you know, multi-threaded in Spark local mode. Uh, and with just by changing the master URL, you can run it on your cluster of 1,000 or 10,000 nodes. This is the same thing in Python. Um, so again, it looks almost exactly the same barring uh, small syntax differences. Um, again, making use of, you know, of fu functional constructs, lambda functions, So one of the core use cases for Spark, and, and one, of the, one of the reasons it was actually initially developed was machine learning and iterative algorithms. Uh, it turned out to be broadly useful and uh, for kind of all, all large-scale data processing, but that was certainly one of the first objectives. So here we can see that the, the Scala, you know, Scala combination of Scala libraries and the Spark API really allows you to get concise code that's much closer to the maths of machine learning. You know, instead of having pages and pages and pages of, uh, of, of Java code to do a simple you know, vector dot product that we've just got uh, we've just got literally you know one vector dot product the other vector um, everything's really succinct so this slide is actually a little bit old um, so the performance difference will be even you know even greater now but when we started out using Spark, uh, it was around version 0.7, give or take. Uh, it didn't have a machine learning library. Uh, it, it had just released the streaming library as an alpha component. So it was pretty early days. We, we actually ported a Hadoop um, recommendation collaborative filtering model uh, from Mahout. Uh, used this, this very similar, you know, it wasn't quite a, a complete port, but it was a, the same algorithm effectively. We wrote our own version um, within uh, within Spark, and we saw, um, I, I actually don't have that on this slide, but you know, we, we saw uh, about a six times, at, le at least a six times speed up, um, and you know, rough, roughly similar kind of lines of code. In fact, ours was, was even less lines of code. I think it was about th a third of the lines of code. Um, since 0 .08 0 .0 0.8.1, uh, Spark has had MLlib, the machine learning library, with a, a much more efficient um, version of the model. So you can see here that, um, and I think this was probably around one point, version 1.1 or 1.0, um, you know, so you have a massive speed up. And even though it's a, it's a much more efficient and complex version of the algorithm, you still have half the lines of code. Uh, as I said, the, the, the latest release will, is even more performant. So I think that, that performance difference will be, you know, probably another order of magnitude or maybe almost. So that's just to give you an illustration. Uh, on the left is is the uh, the same Hadoop um, Mahout code for, for for the algorithm, and on the right is what we what we wrote for ourselves. Um, so this isn't the MLlib built-in model anymore. That's that's become quite quite complex now and, and very you know very efficient, much more scalable than our initial kind of uh, port. But you can really see I've tried to highlight there where where you're doing. Um, Matrix multiple you know, matrix vector operations in purple, and it's literally, you know, looks like the maths. I mean, if you're familiar with the MATLAB and, and so on, it's really and and scikit-learn and NumPy for in Python, it's really close. 
uh, that's the same thing on the left in, in purple. So, you know, multiple lines of code, boilerplate, it's horrible. Um, and then element-wise operations, similarly in orange. Yeah, so, so comparing it to, you know, even if there was no performance difference from a, from a, uh, a developer performance perspective, the APIs and the ability to use succinct uh, Scala or, or, or Python code is, is a huge win. So the built-in Spark SQL engine um, means that you, you don't have to um, use um, a, separate, you know, uh, a separate project like Hive or something to do Spark. Uh, sorry, to do SQL, you can you can literally drop in your your SQL queries uh, into in, into the middle of your Spark job. So you know you can do some um, some complex processing you know uh, that that doesn't quite fit into SQL in the middle of a couple of queries, as you can see here. I won't go too much into into performance, um, and and these are a little bit old, but. You know the the performance of of Spark SQL when cached in memory is, uh, yeah, and 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 we 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 heard about you know bench marketing and and there is a lot of that in this in this industry, but the performance is certainly on par with um, with Impala and Tez and the other open source projects, um, and and is is often you know, often beats it too. Uh, so how much time do we have? Five minutes in total left. Okay. So, okay. I, I just want to make sure I've got enough time to to try and do the demo because you know it's it's fine to listen to me yammer on, and, but uh, it's always nice to try and show you show you something real. Um, so, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to get through, and I always find that you know it's a it's a huge amount of of stuff to try and talk about, and I've only just scratched the surface. So. You know, uh, we've we've built our entire company in our future, and you know we've bet that on on Apache Spark, um, and we we did that more than two years ago, and I think that that you know I, I we feel that 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 faith has really played out. You know, we're now at when we started, we were at zero point seven. We're now at one point three point zero. The the release candidate is is out for vote right now. Um, all the major Hadoop vendors have, have announced support, uh, unequivocal support for Apache Spark as the successor to MapReduce. Um, you know, you've got Databricks bringing up as the, as the kind of Cloudera or Red Hat of, of the Spark project, um, they're founded by the, the project founders themselves. So, you know, I think it's got a, a massively bright future. If you want to try it out, you can, you can go and download the latest version from the Spark website. You can run it on your laptop. You can spin up a cluster in EC2 with the, the launching scripts and, and try it out in your data. So, I'm going to I'm going to see if I can get the uh, the demo working. Just do that. If anyone worships the demo gods, they should start praying now. <laughs> see that okay so the demo we have here um, I, I'm using EC2 um, so we, we spun up a cluster uh, we've got one master node and, and eight slaves um, each of them have 32 gigs of RAM and I think eight cores so we can see our cluster here yeah so you know, we've allocated uh, eight, eight cores and 28 gigs of memory. I think we've got about 220 in total. 
uh, available to us. So it's re it's really quick. I haven't done anything too complicated. I just want to show you a little bit about um, about what you can do. So uh, I'm using the Python uh, PySpark, the, the Python API, and I've attached a, an IPython console uh, notebook uh, to to this uh, process. Um, and you know, just to, just to show you kind of how easy everything is. Um, So we've got a path here to, you know, to, uh, to S3. Uh, we create a, a, a RDD, which is a Resilient Distributed Dataset. It's the, it's a kind of distributed collection um, abstraction that Spark provides, uh, and we, and this is from a, a user visit dataset. So it's it's around 150 gigabytes of raw data, about 775 million rows, um, and you know all it does is gives you, you know, an IP address. Um, uh, that's the URL, but it's, it's kind of uh, anonymized. The date, some some ad revenue, user agents, sort of fairly fairly standard web log stuff. So I'm just going to show a little bit about the uh, the SQL SQL engine and what that looks like. So you can you can see here that we've got the you know, we, we apply a, tr a transform to just split those fields up by you know, it's a CSV file, um, and we can see what we've got the, we've got over there, and the SQL engine is fully supports various uh, files, you know, file formats, Parquet, columnar storage, uh, JSON. Um, so for flat files, we just have to give it a, a schema. So, you know, we we, we split up. The, we've got those those fields, and we create a Spark SQL row with IP address, with the URL, with date and country code, revenue, etc. Uh, Spark SQL is kind of smart, so we can just tell it to infer the schema, which which it does for us. So we can see we've got all those fields there. You know, if you pass it a bunch of JSON documents, it'll be smart about that and go and infer the scheme automatically, for example. We register our temp table. Um, and here we're telling Spark to cache the table in memory. So obviously it, just don't, it doesn't magically just jump into memory. We first have to read all the data off disk. Well, in this case, we have to pay the network cost off of S3. Um, but what it means is that the first time we read the data, it'll be cached. And the second time, we would hope that you know, it's going to be a lot quicker. So if we do a count, we can see the total count there is about 750 million. Now, that took this morning before I arrived uh, 19 minutes to, to run. Uh, total data size of 118 gigabytes. You know, so we, now we can see, have we got all of that cached into memory? We do, 100% uh, cached. Uh, Spark SQL is now really smart about um, compressing, uh, you know, column compression. Um, so it was, it's, it was about 120 gigabytes of raw, uh, you know, raw data, but in memory only takes up 42. So you know, we, we've got a lot, lots of places, uh, space to play with in this cluster. We don't have to worry too much about it. So if I hit, uh, you know, this is just a select count, so something pretty straightforward. So it took 19 minutes the first time. The second time, 1.6 seconds to count 750 million rows of data across eight, uh, eight machines. Not too bad. So this is uh, not much more complicated, but you know, let's just sum the revenue up. And that should, I think, take around seven, eight, nine seconds. Yeah, so seven seconds there. And finally, we'll just you know we'll just do something a little bit more complex, but again, not much more complex. Just do a, a group by. So that's that's a bit of shuffling around, um, slightly more kind of intensive. So yeah, I think that takes fifteen to twenty seconds. So we'll just wait, but not too long. Um, I wouldn't make you guys wait for nineteen minutes. Yeah, so 17 seconds. So yeah, I mean that's really a whirlwind tour through some of the SQL capabilities. You know, so with with very little um, setup, with very little pain, you can uh, you can run fairly familiar SQL syntax over 750 million rows of data. You know, 
counts it all in two seconds, sum up a, f a column in seven seconds, do a slightly you know, s standard, nothing too complex, but sort of still fairly, uh, f fairly useful uh, group by query, 17 seconds. So you know, this really allows uh, interactive data analytics in real time across massive data. And then obviously, because we're in Python, we can just chuck in any Python library we have. I mean, I could show you, uh, you, know, you want to use uh, your latest model from scikit-learn, you can kind of drop that in uh, with a caveat that you, know, you have to have a distributed version or a parallel-friendly version. Uh, here, we're just going to you know, plot the, the top 10 revenues by country. And there we go. You know, so this could be export, you know, because we're using, uh, well, it's now called Jupyter, but the IPython notebook, this could, you know, you could turn this into a, an interactive dashboard. Uh, we use it a lot for exploration. Um, so you can, you know, the same kind of very familiar tools that you use to analyze your, your 10,000 or 100,000 rows of data, you know, you can very quickly um, move from, from that to, uh, you know, prototyping it locally or on a small piece of the data, very quickly move to, uh, to interactively analyzing or productionizing your queries on you know, billions of rows of data. And that's pretty much it. So that was live demo. Yeah, um, we're Graphflow. I'm Nick. Hit me up. Uh, give me an email. I look forward to the questions. And yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so, what sort of um, command, SQL commands does uh, Spark support? I mean, can you do things like joins and that sort of thing? Or is it just more select and group by? Yeah, no, good question. Um, it, uh, it, it supports a, a lot now. Um, so, yes, you can absolutely do joins. You can, you, know, you can join as many tables as you want. Um, you can do left, left outer, right outer, you know, inner joins. Um, it supports uh, it support it supports most of what the the Hive query language does, which is it's you know quite similar to to MySQL, MySQL, um, lacking a couple of things. But um, you know, w w when when Hive was in its early days, it, it it barely supported joins, and then it became more and more complex. Um, so you know pretty much pretty much everything that's kind of an equality join will work fine. I mean, you. you you, used, you know, you did have. I'm not sure if it's still the case, but you recently did have issues with with inequality joins. That sort of thing is is, is not so easy. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, any, anything, any any kind of group by um, sub queries joins, yeah, it all works. Uh, so you mentioned that this is now lateral computing, um, so to speak. Uh, at what point do you decide to implement something like that? At what point does a business, does it justify going to something like this? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, because it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's always a trade-off. Uh, it, it depends on your scale. If, you, if you're Google you know, or if you're Yahoo, um, this, was, this was not an option. You had, to, you had to do this. I mean, that's why they, they kind of came up with stuff in the first place. Um, the old technologies that they had just simply did not scale. Um, it definitely doesn't make sense at, at small scale um, because obviously there's more cost involved in, in, having, you know, in, in having a cluster of machines. There's a lot of overhead developer overhead and learning the frameworks, uh, tuning them, DevOps, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think, I think in, in, there's two cases that I'd like to talk about. And, and the one, I'll give you an example about the, the startup case, the cowboy case, I guess. And, and the, the second one is where you might have you know, uh, a bit more time to reason through things. So in the second case, um, when, you hit the, when you start hitting the scalability um, sort of constraints of your existing systems, you know, let's say using Postgres or MySQL or whatever it is, uh, Oracle, you know, SQL Server, um, and you know, it, it's taking you hours or, or days to do things like analytics queries. You know, um, certainly I can speak about the mix of days where it would take you know, hours and sometimes days to do certain things um, before Hadoop. 
uh, yeah, if you tr if you translate that same workload to a, a moder moderately sized Hadoop cluster, you'll typically find that something that would used to take it one or two days would take one or two hours. So I, I think when you hit that point where the cost of, of you know, vertically scaling that, that proprietary system or that open source system on a single node starts becoming prohibitive uh, compared to the cost of running, let's say, you know, a five or 10 node Hadoop cluster in your, in your data center or EC2, um, that, you know, that is probably the point where you want to think about it. Uh, but I would, I would say, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're talking anywhere from you know, five, 10 million rows of data per day or something like that, you know, that, that's certainly the size where it makes a lot of sense. So, uh, and I'll quickly talk about the first instance, which was when I worked in a startup in, in London, which did ad targeting. We were all MySQL for our analytics reports and a massive from Yahoo themselves. And they phoned us the next day or emailed us the next day and said, hey, we're seeing you know, these numbers for this kind of 200 million um, impression campaign. Uh, can you confirm that you're seeing the same? And we said, well, uh, you know, our, our, our analytics job will probably only finish next week. <laughs> so our, um, our infrastructure and, and, and data engineer migrated everything from MySQL to Hadoop uh, running in Elastic MapReduce in, one, you know, in about five days. We had to, I mean, otherwise we'd lose contract. So I think those are the two cases where you, know, you, you really quickly hit the scaling problem you know, constraints, or maybe over time you start realizing this is too costly or taking too long. And last question. Uh, can I sneak in two last questions? First, yesterday's speaker um, mentioned they were using Spark in parallel with Hadoop, but it sounds like you're positioning the one as a successor to the other. Is there still use cases for using both? And uh, both the Graphflow speakers uh, mentioned you're using Elasticsearch. What do you use that for? Okay, great question. So the first part of your question, who mentioned that they were using uh, Spark? And Hadoop? I think uh, for the, the speaker from Microsoft. Oh, right, right. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so Hadoop often get, you know, the, the, the file system and MapReduce often just get referred to as Hadoop. Um, they are one project, but they're actually two very different things. So HDFS is, is, is the file system, distributed file system, um, and, and you know, Hadoop MapReduce is the framework for running computation. Yes, they can absolutely coexist. Spark is developed from the ground up to be fully compatible with HDFS. It's obviously, you, you can run it together with MapReduce on the same node, no problem with that, um, but it's designed to replace the MapReduce component. So we don't use HDFS, that's true, um, but many, many, many organizations do, and that's probably the overwhelming use case or scenario where people might be migrating parts of their workload or maybe all of their workload to Spark is they typically would keep the HDFS component and, and check out the, you know, the, the processing, the MapReduce component. Um, the second question, also really good. Uh, we use Elasticsearch for pretty much everything. Uh, data storage, event, you know, event data storage, filtering. Uh, we use a lot of the aggregation stuff. It works really well uh, with, with Spark. So uh, Spark's fully compatible with any Hadoop input format and output format. An input format is just a you know, an, an interface that says, how do I read records of data from a, a data source? Uh, Elasticsearch um, started out with a, a Hadoop connector, which provides an input format, which you can then use to, to read data from Elasticsearch. They now have a, a, a built-in Spark native um, kind of RDD generator function so that you can just point it to an index and you get your data out as JSON or uh, integrate directly with Spark SQL and have it infer the schema from your Elasticsearch um, schema. And, you know, and do your queries like that. So it integrates perfectly. Uh, and in fact, we migrated our entire infrastructure from, from an HBase-based -base infrastructure to Elasticsearch-based, which is the subject of another talk. <laughs> um, and all we had to change in the backend uh, processing jobs was about five lines of code to switch out that input format. That was it. So yeah, really, really smooth. <laughs>